So Holly, I will stop sharing my screen and if you can share your screen, please. Um, we'll hand over to you for the first presentation. So, hello everyone. Um, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're on. I, I find it fun to connect with everyone around the world on a day when many of us were actually expecting to arrive in Oxford for the International Human Wildlife Conflict Conference. And ironically, we were actually planning on doing a, a very interactive session using some interesting software at that meeting. And we seem to have succeeded one way or another, although using a different bit of, of kit. So, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some things that are a little bit different than what we were intending for Oxford, but I hope it will also be in, in, informational for all of you. Um, some time ago, a group of us uh, began to become sort of aware of the response to the, what was known and referred to as the poaching crisis. And what we saw was that there was a tremendous um, reaction through law enforcement along the entire value chain. And in addition to that, a, a, an attempt to reduce demand for illegal products. So a lot of projects began. But one of the things we noticed was that far fewer things were beginning in terms of engaging with local communities. And we really believed that to be somewhat of a shortcoming and something that needed to have further investigation. Because very much our view was that what it's all about is changing the relationship between people and wildlife and in changing it, trying in whatever ways to achieve positive outcomes for both. And in so doing, as we began looking into this with, with a group of colleagues, we really began to see that there was sort of what we call a basic equation. And that was that the benefits from conserving wildlife minus the costs of conserving wildlife. And we can never forget that there are many, many costs to conserving wildlife. And many of those are borne by local communities. So we consider those to be the net benefits of conserving. And these we thought had to remain greater than the benefits from engaging in illegal wildlife trade, um, minus of course the costs of that engagement, which in many, many places around the world are still actually rather low because law enforcement efforts, regardless of being pumped up, still generally are falling behind the wave in terms of the uh, activity of poaching and illegal trade at the local level. So we, we, we started by putting together what we consider to be a, a rather basic theory of change. And this didn't just come out of our heads, this came out of an initiative we had called Beyond Enforcement, where we were asking people from around the world to share with us what kinds of activities they had had and what sort of projects they had with local communities around the world to try and address the illegal wildlife trade issue. And basically we came up with four key pathways. And those are the first one being to increase the costs of participating in illegal wildlife trade, to increase the incentives for stewardship, and to decrease the costs of living with wildlife. And lastly, increasing non-wildlife based livelihoods. Now, I could go into all of this in rather great depth, but because we're focusing on um, uh, human wildlife conflict, I'm really gonna put the focus of this talk into that area. But just to let you know that what we discovered was the most important thing is where those orange circles lie. And those are the assumptions that sit behind each of these pathways in terms of how we're using actions to get at decreasing the pressure on species from illegal wildlife trade. So each pathway has this particular sort of layout, starting at the bottom with enabling actions, interventions, and then the assumptions of, of those, giving us outputs, and then going into assumptions, again, the interim outcomes, et cetera. And in the end, achieving the impacts that we're after. So if I start on looking at this pathway, pathway C, we call it, decreasing the cost of living with wildlife, we began by working with communities to understand how they saw that as a part of the overall whole. And just to give you a couple of examples, we began, and this is this, I'm gonna give two examples. This is one of the communities that we worked with. They felt that decreasing human wildlife conflict was the goal there at the bottom of that pathway. 
and that to get to that next step of outputs, there had to be a functioning and equitable distribution mechanism for compensation payments for wildlife damage, and, and that this money was not subject to elite capture and corruption. These were two of their key assumptions. Next, to get to that next level up, that communities would be better able to mitigate wildlife conflict through um, feeling a decreased antagonism towards that wildlife. And lastly, at this that I'm going to go into is that communities, as a result, would experience a decreased cost of living with wildlife and have a decreased incentive to actively or tacitly support illegal wildlife trade. So this was this is what came from one of the communities that we worked with. This was not us coming up with it. So we went to another community and we worked with them on their very same pathways, but they had a totally different view of how to reduce the cost of living with wildlife. They saw it more as a competition for grazing and that the major factor was to actually get at this competition. So they felt that physical separation from the wildlife was needed to eliminate that competition and to reduce their feeling of antagonism towards, towards the wildlife. And these communities again felt that by experience, experiencing a decreased cost of living with the wildlife, and they would have a decreased incentive to actively or tacitly participate. And so that made them feel that they would be more willing to stand up against it. So these were two very, very different views. And importantly, um, if I put them together so that we can see them next to one another, you'll see that at the bottom, they had a different view of even the starting point, how to begin. They also had radically different views of where poaching sat in their overall views. So for example, the ones on the left, they had a very concerted sort of effort around reducing poaching. The ones on the right, and you'll see at the very top, they said that functioning and intact natural ecosystems were far more important to them and were their ultimate goal, as opposed to just decreasing the pressure on, on species. So this is the reality of going out when you talk to people no sense in going into all the details here, but everything in every box is different here. So this was using the very same way of, of communicating with communities and letting them express their voice and their experience. So we have created a number of tools for this, and I'll come on to later on how you can find these. We've actually just begun, um, well, actually we're just finishing up with the Southern African Wildlife College who has taken it upon themselves to help us to design a further training module that will help people to learn how to implement these many tools that we have um, themselves in the field, wherever they are, wherever they're experiencing, wherever they're engaging local communities. So I thought it would be useful to just share a few lessons. Um, the first thing we found out and what really pushed us along the way was that many projects to date have actually failed in stemming human wildlife conflict or illegal wildlife trade. And we believe this to be about no engagement with the communities from the start, resulting in flawed assumptions. And you'll remember that this, the assumptions being really the key focus point on this. And that this has obviously led to some very deeply flawed theories of change underpinning project design. So even though money might be going into working with local communities, it doesn't seem to be having the effects wanted in many, many projects. So coming back to this again, um, one of the things that I mentioned to you was that we would only be looking at decreasing the cost of living with wildlife. But actually, what we've discovered is that for communities, Simply giving benefits, which is a very, very typical part of projects and approaches by donors these days, that that alone is not enough. So you can continue to give incentives and benefits, but you must also put energy into decreasing the cost of living with wildlife. So it's not a situation where, well, we gave you a benefit, therefore you should be, you should be thankful and happy. Communities that we have interacted with feel that mo both are absolutely essential. And that, that comes back to solving the basic equation, equation, which we think is fundamental. And that is, again, that the net benefits of conserving, including, of course, the costs of human wildlife conflict, whether it's mitigation or whether it's the costs of, um, of separation or any other technique, that they must, must 
uh, be greater than any of the net benefits of poaching. And as we know, that means there's a heavy load on the left-hand side because there are a lot of benefits still to poaching. What are the basic characteristics that the benefits should have? Well, that the costs have to accrue where, uh, sorry, the benefits have to accrue where the costs are incurred. There are many programs now for biodiversity offsets and other types of offset offsets, but when the benefits aren't actually arriving with the people who carry the cost, they're not very influential. Obviously, where revenues are actually earned from exercising rights over wildlife, they have to be as close as 100% to 100% as possible. We hear about a lot of places where small amounts of benefits are given 5%, 3%. Sometimes they're not even financial and that's fine, but where they do occur, they should be as close to 100% as possible in order to get the stewardship that we're after. These benefits, of course, have to be equitably shared and there is much to be learned around that that corruption and elite capture must, not, must be minimized um, to the greatest extent made impossible. And that linking the accountability for demonstrated stewardship of wildlife is very, very important. In other words, benefits should not come if we don't have clear ways of linking the stewardship to those benefits. Thirdly, that it's not just about the benefits, as I just said before, that even where benefits are accrued by communities, they still do not tolerate continued conflict well. In some cases, the communities may rely on local mitigation efforts, and I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about that, but they may not be adequate. In other cases, they may prefer physical separation, but we have to be aware that when we begin to have physical separation, even to the extent of fencing, this is now going to cause other major knock-on effects and ecological impacts um, as we start to carve up the, the landscapes. But you know, empowering communities and reducing the cost of living with wildlife can have much broader conservation benefits. Habitat loss and degradation still is a major threat, even, even when um, species are threatened by human wildlife conflict and illegal wildlife trade, habitat loss and degradation probably is still the greater effect. And of course, we have to reduce retaliatory killing for human wildlife conflict. That's important. And in some places, it's still very, very high. Um, Community-based approaches, though, when taken in all these ways that we can learn, primarily through working with the communities, can result in rather than wildlife not being a part of greater landscape level systems, that that can be removed and that wildlife can be a very, very effective land use and that tolerance for the negative impacts of living with wildlife can be increased. So just to end, to say that, you know, we've done a lot of work on this level. I've provided you there with a, with a good link that can get you to our tools and many of the publications that we've had to date. And I'll stop there and say thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Holly. Could you go back to the slide where you presented the two very different cases um, to do with human wildlife conflict? Yeah, that one. Could you, so we've had just a few questions about this slide. We were just wondering, yeah, brilliant. So could you just explain what country you were talking about, um, what the community, where the communities are, um, and what type of wildlife um, are you talking about in relation to these two case studies? So, so I very specifically chose here two examples that are both in the same country and actually are among ethnic groups that are living the same lifestyle and are the same. So they're both from Kenya. They occur in areas that are not very far away from one another. Um, and the types of wildlife that are involved here are large, large herbivores, so elephants, lots of grazing herbivores, uh, the wildebeest migrations come through this area, and also, of course, all the large predators. So these areas have lions, uh, leopards, hyenas, cheetahs, they have, they're experiencing all of that. Another question submitted was, do you have any thoughts on strategies about how to manage a situation where the benefits of illegal wildlife trade are low for the majority of people, but are so high for few people. Yeah, 
I think that's a critical question. And although I didn't directly address our, our topic of enabling actions, one of the very key things that we're finding is, of course, when it comes to costs and benefits, you can have a situation where uh, an individual is benefiting and the entire community takes a cost, or when an individual is taking a cost, such as through conflict, and the community continues to benefit, such as through tourism revenues. And I think that what we find is that the best way to deal with this is to begin to have these very open conversations within the community so that these things become surfaced. Because what you don't see, and what you would if you look at our tools, is that when we get down to the assumptions, a very critical thing that we ask is, who is benefiting? And who is taking the cost? And that opens up the conversation very broadly. Uh, we've had definitely even circumstances where people have been very more than willing to say there are people right here around this tree <laughs> in this conversation who are benefiting from poaching while many of us are taking the costs of law enforcement. So more or less the opening of the conversation, um, of course, is very, very difficult if uh, you don't have abilities to bring any of the poaching under control. But if you go back and look at the, the presentation again, you'll see that pathway A was about disincentivizing involvement in illegal wildlife trade. And we see that and every community we've worked with sees that as essential, that you would have either state-led law enforcement or community sanctions, so community norms and standards, or both active at the same time. And all communities have believed that those things are also essential. Great, Holly, thank you. And then in these two examples, we've had a question. Um, do these two case studies have the same governance structure? Are they government run? Are they public private partnership? Could you tell us a little bit more about the governance arrangements of these two case studies? Right, so these two case studies have completely different governance structures. Um, the one on the left has a structure that is all within the community itself. They have several different, um, different levels. So they have a group that does management, then they have a group that works on tourism, they have another grouping that works on, on conflict issues, and they have one group that sort of brings the whole community together. They do work with a group of external researchers, but the researchers come in to answer the questions of the community. It's a rather unusual place. Uh, instead of the researchers coming in to tell them what they need research on, they, they invite them. The one on the right-hand side is a partnership between private sector and the local community. Um, in both cases, the area that is under consideration, in other words, the very specific geographical location, is demarcated um, on a map, so they, they do know where the boundaries are. In both cases, there are multiple villages involved. Um, there are somewhat different numbers of people involved, but it's all in the thousands. Uh, probably quite close, actually. But one would be a the one on the left is a larger area, um, which has much less tourism in it, much, much less tourism. The one on the right is a, an area with much higher wildlife and much greater tourism. I was going to point, say also that um, when you go to, to the website, you can find um, at least the one on the right has been written up. And I think the one on the left is also up now as well. So you can find these. We wrote up very detailed case studies. In Francesca's absence, Holly, just one question which has been coming up a lot in the Q&A is about how to deal with entrenched corruption and elite capture, um, particularly in terms of the benefit sharing equation. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yeah. Um, you'll see that I brought up our general sort of theory of change here and down at the bottom, you'll see fighting corruption and strengthening governance as, as being one of the enabling actions. And um, of course, everyone is, is confronted with this and particularly in the very high value um, illegal wildlife trade chains. And I think that what, what many countries are finding is that the corruption is occurring 
actually further down the supply chain. So as as different as different communities are feeding in product, where those nodes are happening of of greater um, really really more organized criminal networks. So as opposed to just the elite capture at the site, the elite capture that goes along the entire uh, value chain of the trade. When it comes to just local level, uh, I think what we've found is it's, it's kind of practical in communities. They generally are pretty well aware of who might be capturing more revenues than others. Um, I think it would be the most honest thing to say in many of the communities that we've worked in, they tend to feel that what goes around comes around, that sometimes when people get a little bit too greedy, then they get cut off and then another group starts. So we haven't come across cases where people say, look, there's absolutely no corruption. But what we have found is that where these more open and transparent systems of governance, where, where people come together and have a platform, that there is much more ability to surface these issues. When it gets, of course, to a step away from a community or two steps away, this then becomes much more the realm of, of uh, national and perhaps provincial and, and local um, state-led law enforcement. Thanks, Holly. Could you once again just flash up where people can get more information on FLOD yep. um, and what you've spoken about today? Because we have a lot of questions about how do we understand and use these right. tools. So could you just share that before we move on? I will just share that again. And, and just to say that we should be having um, this full, fully fledged training module within the next couple of months. Of course, you know, the COVID has hit us all. We were actually scheduled in the next couple of weeks to be holding the piloting of our new tools. So we're pretty far along. And what we really, really hope is that more and more people just, um, you know, take the opportunity to look at these tools and see what benefits they can bring you. Because what we've found is that they've been an absolutely wonderful way of helping to bring community voice to the fore. Do keep submitting your questions through the Q&A. Um, and we'll move on to Liv's presentation. Right, so hi everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so as Francesca said, my name is Liv Wilson-Holt and I am the People Not Poaching Coordinator. And today I'm going to introduce People Not Poaching, um, take you through some of our case studies that are responding to the need to decrease the costs of living with wildlife as part of their anti-poaching strategy, as well as take you through some of the features we have on People Not Poaching um, and how you can contribute. So hopefully you're all a little bit familiar with what People Not Poaching is. But essentially, we are one component of a project led by IIED called Learning and Action for Community Engagement Against Illegal Wildlife Trade, or LEAP for short. And LEAP is funded by the UK government's Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund. So the aim of People Not Poaching, or PNP, is to build a global evidence base of initiatives that engage communities in tackling IWT. And what we want to understand from these initiatives is what works, what doesn't work and why in efforts that have involved or are involving communities in anti-poaching anti activities. So you can see our home page to the right here and on our website you can find plenty of background information on communities and IWT, including um, all the stuff that Holly's just spoken about, as well as case studies, resources, as well as relevant events. So. I'll be taking you through some of these features a little bit later on, but for now we're going to focus on some of the case studies we have on the site that are decreasing the costs of living with wildlife for local communities around the world. So we've got nearly 100 case studies at the moment, and in nearly a third of these, 31 of 98, are responding to the need to reduce the costs of living with wildlife in order to reduce the motivation to carry out revenge killings or become involved in poaching activities. So as Holly discussed, this is one of the four change pathways and underneath it sets the following activities. So we've got preventative measures to deter wildlife, reactive measures to deal with problem animals, financial mitigation measures, 
and the physical separation of people and all their livestock and wildlife. So when you upload a case study, you can select any number of these particular activities. And we also give people the option to select other and provide any details they'd like. And out of these activities, 19 case studies are responding um, via prevention of human wildlife conflict. Nine are undertaking activities that are reacting to human wildlife conflict. Eight are financially mitigating costs and seven are physically separating people and wildlife. So as you might have guessed, uh, many of the case studies focus on elephants, both in Africa and Asia, as well as big cats, such as tigers, lions, and snow leopards. However, we also have case studies on other species, such as hippos and crocodiles in Africa and vicuña across the Andes. And some are a little less predictable, um, such as whale sharks. And nearly all of the case studies that mitigate human carnivore conflict have constructed predator-proof enclosures to protect livestock. And likewise, crop raiding is often prevented through elephant-safe stores and by planting non-palatable crops. In addition, many initiatives have set up rapid response units and patrol programs to both ward off animals that stray onto human-occupied landscapes and to react to incidents quickly and effectively. And other deterrents such as fences are common as is land use zoning, particularly in areas with ranchers or pastoralists. Now, in terms of financial mitigation approaches, compensation funds and insurance schemes, such as the wildlife pay scheme and a predator compensation fund, which are both in Kenya, can be effective, um, particularly if communities are involved in their design and management. So by reducing human wildlife conflict, these initiatives hope to change attitudes, uh, attitudes about wildlife and conservation and subsequently reduce revenge killings and motivations for involvement in poaching activities. And we've got some great examples of success as you'll hear about over the next few minutes. So first up is a closer look at our case studies that respond to human snow leopard conflict. Now, all of these projects are located in the mountainous regions of Central Asia, including Tajikistan, Mongolia and Afghanistan. And in this region, Many communities depend entirely on livestock for their livelihoods, making even one lost predation economically serious. And this sometimes results in snow leopards killed due to human wildlife conflict being funneled into IWT as a way of compensating for the loss of livestock and as a way of earning extra income. For example, one project implemented by the community-based wildlife conservancies of Tajikistan estimates that as many as half of all snow leopard deaths in the area they work in are the direct consequence of human wildlife conflict. So a common and immediate approach to mitigating conflict is to construct predator-proof livestock enclosures to prevent predation. The project in Tajikistan has, for example, built 12 communal corals to protect about 8,000 sheep and goats, plus any villages awaiting corals are provided with lights to deter snow leopards before the corals are constructed. In Afghanistan, the Wildlife Conservation Society have also built 35 communal corals in the Wakan Corridor, as well as making improvements to individual household corals. Now, although these can be effective, these initiatives also recognize that communities need a financial incentive to protect snow leopards. And this is why the Snow Leopard Trust um, implemented snow leopard enterprises in Mongolia in 1998. And the idea behind snow leopard enterprises is to provide herders with improved access to markets and to add value to handicrafts produced by local women in exchange for a conservation commitment aimed at protecting snow leopards from persecution. And the incentive program was developed through discussions with herders and it works with snow leopard enterprises, it works, sorry, by snow leopard enterprises committing to purchase a number of handicrafts in return for herders committing to stop poaching snow leopards and their prey. And as an added incentive, any violation of the rules results in a loss of bonus for all participants and also a potential loss of programme membership. And this initiative has been really successful. And between 1998 and 2003, there were no reports of snow leopards killed at any project sites and families can now increase their income by 40%. And today, snow leopard enterprises have expanded into Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and India, 
reaching over 40 communities. So on to elephants now, which we know can be a major problem for communities in Africa and Asia. And here, nearly all of our case studies are adopting preventative measures in attempts to reduce human elephant conflict. For example, using chili bombs, fences and blasters, the use of proofed grain stores and water supplies, plus patrols to ward off animals away from crops. Um, and so nine of our case studies are decreasing the costs of living with elephants. And I'm going to focus on two of these today. The Kina Batangan Orangutan Conservation Program in Malaysia and Conservation Lower Zambezi, working on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. So the Kina Batangan Orangutan Conservation Program is run by a French NGO called Hutan, who recognised how the growing threat of human elephant conflict in Malaysia and Borneo was leading to an increase in poaching. So in response, they introduced a wildlife surveys and protection team to conduct night patrols and to maintain electric fencing, which will help protect community crops. They have also set up an elephant con conservation unit with a group of villagers, which helps local farmers manage damage from crop raiding. And the unit has been really successful in greatly reducing the extent of damage caused by elephants. And over to Africa and conservation Lower Zambezi, who are working in the Chihuahua game management area, where high incidence of human wildlife conflict has resulted in community resentment and retaliatory killings. So the initiative therefore aims to address motivations for poaching and IWT. The strategy includes patrols by village scouts, as well as training in elephant behavior, the construction of over 30 elephant safe granary stores, and also chili farming, which acts both as a deterrent and as a way to earn extra income with chili sold to a local condiment producer. And in addition, an anti-hippo fence was erected to protect the crops of 20 farmers. And levels of poaching in the area appear to have reduced. And the key message from both of these initiatives is how important it is to provide support to communities in any projects that are aimed at protecting wildlife. So human wildlife conflict isn't just confined to land. And two of our case studies are working to conserve whale sharks that is sometimes caught in nets and subsequently killed by fishermen. And in Venezuela, the Shark Research Center has been working with local communities to provide alternative livelihoods to reduce poaching, as a whale shark fin can provide five times an average monthly salary and impoverished coastal communities have little other income opportunity. So to help incentivize conservation, they introduced um, compensation for damaged nets and encourage fishermen to keep photographic and audio records of whale shark sightings. So this was hoped um, that it would help also avoid the use of prohibited nets, which were not subject to compensation. However, this proved to be a challenge as it was difficult to establish whether or not nets were in fact prohibited, leading to anger amongst some fishermen. Overall, however, the project has been really successful with no whale sharks poached in the last 17 months. And in India, compensation for damaged nets proved to be a little more effective. Um, and to help verify claims, the Whale Shark Conservation Project, which is led by the Wildlife Trust of India, has distributed over a thousand cameras to local fishermen to document whale shark releases, which is a condition of them getting compensation for damaged nets. So currently over 700 whale shark releases from nets have been documented and success has really been attributed to fishermen having responsibility for this documentation, which has both resulted in more effective compensation process and puts less stress on the sharks during release. So that is the case studies. Um, but while we're here, we thought it would be a good idea to take you through some of the other features of PNP. So along with the case studies and background information on communities and IWT, we also have a number of different resources, plus country profiles with relevant documents and also information on previous and upcoming events. So as well as collecting case studies, um, we also want to build a database of resources on communities and IWT. And we currently have over 100 resources on the site, and you can see a couple of recent uploads here which include a baseline report from our partners, TNRF and Tanzania, 
a video from Project Leader Dillis um, and a recent journal article. And as this shows, resources can range from videos, whether that is a TED talk or a presentation, to a journal article and other publications, to workshop reports and toolkits. And all of these can be accessed from the Explore tab on the website, plus all of the key background and leap project documents, such as the FLOD initiative that Holly was speaking about, can also be found on our global context page. And anyone is able to upload resources and we strongly encourage you to do so. And I'll show you how you can do this in a few minutes time. So we've also introduced a new feature called Country Profiles. So these are intended to be a place where you can find all you need in terms of case studies, resources, as well as strategies, policies, legislation, species action plans, and so on for each country. So here you can see the profile for Zambia with some of the case studies that are located there. And here we have some Zambian strategy and policy documents that are relevant to IWT and communities. So this feature is still in its early stages um, and we are slowly building these up for each country. So it'd be really useful to get your feedback on these profiles as, whether, as well as whether or not you think we are missing anything. And lastly, we have an events page for both previous and forthcoming events that are related to IWT and communities. And these could range from high level government conferences to national dialogues held as part of our LEAP project. And if you click on the more information button, you can find more details of the events, including agendas, presentations given, reports and other outcomes. So what can you do? Well, we're always on the lookout for new case studies and resources. And if you know of any projects that may be relevant, please do get in touch at peoplenotpoaching at gmail.com. Or if you know of any people working in this area who may be aware of projects, we would love it if you could encourage them to get in touch with us. And just to give you an idea of the sort of information we are looking for, here's an example of a case study we received the other day. And in this example, the author downloaded one of our case study templates and sent it in via email. And you can find all these templates, um, here they are at the bottom, on our contribute page. Um, and we've got two different types. The overview template is meant to provide a snapshot of initiatives. And the comprehensive template does what it says in the tin and allows you to go into much more detail. Um, so as you can see here, we've also got templates available in Spanish and French also. And you can also upload either a case study or a resource directly onto the site. So if you click one of the two buttons that you can see here, it will take you to an online form. And of course, if you have any questions or are not sure about the best approach, then please do drop me an email. So finally, we would really love it if you could stay in touch. We have an active Twitter account and a new Facebook page where we post relevant publications every Wednesday, as well as case study spotlights twice a week, plus any news or updates. So please do follow us. We also have a new newsletter. The first one went out last week and these will feature updates, case studies, event information and so on. Um, and if you scroll down on our homepage, you'll find this pink banner where you can enter your email address to sign up. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing about People Not Poaching and learning more about some of our case studies. And now on to questions. Thanks very much, Liv. One of the first questions is, could you just clarify the scope of the case studies, particularly the geographic scope of the case studies that PNP, People Not Poaching, is interested in? So is it just Africa, countries in Africa, or is it elsewhere? No, so um, the scope is global. So we are interested in case studies from any country um, and case studies also that cover any species as well. And um, at the moment, we're really interested in having more case studies that are focused on plant species. Um, and we're also on the lookout for case studies from European countries because we don't currently have any. And so I noticed a couple of people in the sidebar as you, as you registered, um, who hopefully may either have a case study up their sleeves or know someone. So yeah, on the hunt for any European ones. Great. 
Thank you. And then could we just take you back to the snow leopard example you shared? Yeah. Could you clarify for the attendees who it is who's paying the local crafts people? Um, and what exactly are local people doing in return? So are they promising not to poach? What is it that they, they promise in return for that? Yeah, so um, Snow Leopard Enterprises, they are the ones that are purchasing the handicrafts uh, from the local women or made by the local women. Um, and the conservation agreement is, like you said, it's an agreement to stop poaching both snow leopards and their prey. And then on the case study you shared about lost and discarded fishing gears. So we have a question on whether, as part of that case study, is there any awareness on the negative implications of the lost and discarded fishing gears alongside the compensation that's offered? Um, so I don't know if I did mention about lost and discarded fishing gears. Um, so what these two case studies do is they provide compensation for nets that are damaged by um, whale sharks, but I'm not sure what they, the fishermen then do with, um, with their nets once they're damaged. It's a financial mitigation approach, um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what they do with the nets once they've been damaged. Great, thanks Liv. Um, and can we move, so we'll, if we can continue to move on um, and listen to Amy for now, just I'm conscious of time, but we will continue to monitor the Q&A and respond to the Q&A and any questions that are not yet answered, we will come to you towards the end of the discussion. But there'll still be time towards the end where we can ask the question to all of our panelists. Amy. Hi everyone, wonderful to be here and talking to you all. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of our project and some more sort of detailed uh, analysis from one case study in a very broad and sort of general way. So I work in Tanzania's Ruaha landscape on human carnivore conflict. And so to give you a perspective for those of you who don't know where Ruaha is, it's a really important landscape for all large carnivores, but particularly for lions and for African wild dogs. So if you look at lion range in particular, it's hugely important because lions used to range extensively across sub-Saharan Africa, this is our latest analysis of lion range, and lion numbers have nearly halved in the last 20 years. So there are very few big populations left. The biggest ones are shown in dark blue here, and conflict is one of the major reasons for this decline in lions. And potentially illegal wildlife trade for lion bone is also a growing threat. Tanzania is the most important country for lions. It has about 40% of the world's lions, and Rawaha down here has about 8% of the world's lions. So really significant. But across Africa, both in Rwanda and elsewhere, much of the lion range is on the same land as extremely poor pastoralists and subsistence farmers. And that leads to impacts on both sides. So it's very common to have situations like this, where one of somebody's few cattle were killed by lions, and then people retaliate unsurprisingly or proactively by killing lions and other carnivores. So the amount of killing that we saw on village land around Rwanda was the highest documented rate of lion mortality anywhere in East Africa. So huge amounts of killing. And when we talked to people, they said particularly it was this Barabeg tribe that were involved, but you really needed to engage with the Barabeg and with other tribes on village land to understand why this level of killing was happening. We tried for two years to understand the amount of killing and try to engage with these people, but found it almost impossible. We lived on village land amongst people, but they would run away from us. They were very hostile towards conservationists until we put up solar panels to charge our laptops. And then the Barabeg turned up to charge their cell phones. And it still kills me that I didn't think of this earlier because it's so obvious that the way to engage people is offering them what they want through conservation rather than trying to approach them with your agenda. So when we finally built this relationship and started discussing things with the communities, there were four key drivers of conflict and killings. The first and the most obvious was high costs of wildlife presence, particularly attacks on livestock. And then very importantly, there were few or no benefits to offset those costs and the benefits that did occur didn't happen where the costs were being um, accrued. Also for warriors, cultural rewards for killing lions. If a warrior went and killed a lion, they got wealth because they were given cattle, they got status in the community, and they got sex because women would dance for them. And there's very little conservation awareness and engagement. So we've worked on all four areas of these um, drives of conflict. 
the first one of the most urgent for people was to try to reduce the tax. And this was done just by reinforcing livestock enclosures. About two thirds of attacks were happening in poorly uh, constructed livestock enclosures. And this was a simple cost sharing basis where the householder committed 25% of the cost. They also committed to upkeep of the uh, maintenance of the BOMAs and we found that really effective. These have reduced attacks by over 95%. They also reduced attacks on neighbours' BOMAs, even those people who haven't actually reinforced their own. We're not quite sure why, but it seems to be important. However, it doesn't work well for mobile pastoralists. So for those, we have now developed these mobile canvas uh, corrals or BOMAs that can be rolled up and moved from site to site. These are placed on crop fields and this has a really important impact of actually improving crop yields within these sites because of the, the dung being trodden into them by the cattle. So this actually has real impact on food security as well as protecting livestock. But obviously you don't just want to protect them at night, you have to protect them in the day. So we brought in Anatolian shepherd guarding dogs, the first time these had been used in East Africa. They look ridiculously small when you give them to a farmer, but actually they grow into intimidating dogs, a little bit too big. We're now looking at breeding them with uh, village dogs to see if we can stem the growth in the first year a little bit because that can be too much of a challenge for local people to maintain the diet these dogs need. But they're very effective and we found they will chase lions away from livestock as well. But it's never enough just to reduce costs as um, Holly and, ever, and others have pointed out, it's all about providing benefits as well. We worked extensively for several years with the communities to understand the benefits they would like and they have three key priorities education for the children, healthcare, particularly of women and newborn children, and veterinary services. We've worked extensively with local authorities to develop programmes on each of these, and we found these were really important at helping to show the communities that we were there with them long term, and that we were actually considering what they needed rather than just us, sort of our goal of reducing lion killing. We've also started a school feeding programme because that was identified as a major issue by the women in particular. We found all of these were really important in engaging people, but we found unsurprisingly that people were taking the benefits, but then still going out and killing carnivals, because why wouldn't you? It's really important that you actually tie the presence of um, benefits to the presence of wildlife on village land. Another thing we had to do was to engage local warriors in conservation. So we worked with lion guardians in Kenya. We've developed a culturally appropriate warrior engagement scheme. This is identifying ways from the warriors themselves that they could get status, they could get attention from women, they could get wealth through conservation rather than lion killing. And the, we employ them as lion trackers, lion conservationists. They explain to us what it meant to be a warrior. It means to be brave and it means to be respected in your community. So because we employ them to track lions, to keep people safe from lions, they get that status and they get wealth every month. In order to get them other status and you know to replace the bravery they showed from killing a lion that seemed very hard to us when we asked them what they thought would best replace it they said it was learning how to read or write because very few people could do it and then in terms of getting attention from women which was key to them they wanted to be able to dance um, so we have conservation dancers once a month in villages where there hasn't been a lion kill and there's lots and lots of women come to these and they see these young men who are really becoming sort of leaders in their communities and this has become a very effective way of changing these, cons these lion killers into conservationists. We also need to raise local awareness and engagement. So we take people into the parks, so they can learn about wildlife um, firsthand and also do DVD nights. So these were great for getting people engaged with our work, but actually, as I said, one of the things that was lacking was how do we show that these benefits don't come from the project, but they come from the presence of the wildlife itself. So you don't have people just getting the benefits and still going out and killing the wildlife. At the time we were doing camera trapping for research and we were finding the camera traps were being stolen. So we brought these two problems together and we trained the local communities to go out and do the camera trapping themselves. And we've come up with a very simple system with them where they get a certain number of points for every wild animal that they catch on their village camera trap. So something small like a dick dick will get you a thousand points. And you get more points for a species if it's more endangered and creates more conflict. So uh, primates will get you 1500 points. It's per individual animal. So this impala and the baboon would get them two and a half thousand points. 
We give more points for carnivores, so a hyena will get you 10,000 points. They will also eat your camera trap. Uh, a lion will get 15,000 points. And the top spot is the African wild dog with 20,000 points. It's per individual animal. So this group of 17 uh, wild dogs gave the village concern 340,000 points. And what happens is that the villagers compete against each other in groups of four villagers. At the end of every three months, uh, we have $5,000 worth of benefits to distribute to the priority needs of those villagers. And so the first village gets $2,000, the next 1,500, the next 1,000, and the next 500. So each village benefits. We also have employment provided through the program because they employ, sorry, we pay for the employment of community camera trap officers. We also show them every month the pictures that are caught in their village. And this has been transformational in engaging people in understanding wildlife on their land and really recognizing that it's the presence of that wildlife that generates the extra benefits. So this goes into extra healthcare, extra education and extra veterinary support. And it means that people see a real reason for tolerating wildlife on village land and there is less support for those people who go out and poach it or engage in illegal wildlife trade. We really, it is key to put people at the heart of conservation. So we have done a book about the work in um, the local languages and made the Barabeg tribe the centre of this because they felt that conservation was not for them. So this has been really important in making sure that it is their story and their engagement in conservation. Impact so far in the core area, we have had the depredation of tax on livestock reduced by over 60%. And most importantly for us as conservationists, the carnival killing has been reduced by over 80%. We've particularly seen the women and the young warriors standing up and going out there and stopping hunts happening. Those warriors that we've employed as lion defenders have now stopped over 120 lion hunts happening. And it's really important that wildlife is now the major driver of local development. So this is recognised. People are starting to protect the camera traps, protect key sites for wildlife, because they see that it really is generating important benefits for them. Key lessons learned and just thoughts for us all is that conflict is obviously multi-layered. So when you first talk to people about it, it's about deprivation, but it actually runs much deeper. You have to consider many diverse factors, people's culture, their religious, um, affiliations, their history with conservation, etc. We found there was a lot of hostility towards conservationists because of past experience. The conflict resolution approaches have to be driven by the needs of the local community, not imposed out, uh, externally. And it's really important to provide benefits that are directly linked to the presence of wildlife, not the presence of an organisation. And people say that you can't change culture. We often find people just say, well, that's impossible to address. It can and it does change quickly if it's in people's interest to do so. There are many ethical and moral issues. How much cost should local communities bear for what is an international good? And how do we make that fair? It's something that I don't have the answer to yet. And there are real concerns that these approaches often rely on the poverty of affected communities. If it's all about economics, we could see conservation strategies being outcompeted by something, say, mining, anything else. So it's got to be about building it into people's culture as well. Issues of sustainability are often brought up to so the community. Camera trapping costs about $80,000 per year for 16 villages, and the project overall costs about $400,000. I personally think this is a responsibility that needs to be met internationally by donors, partners, businesses, philanthropists, because local people are already bearing so much of the opportunity and direct costs of wildlife. And there is ultimately no silver bullet, but each site needs a thorough understanding of the local situation so that we can develop appropriate solutions, which you always need to assess and adapt yourself. And if you want to find out any more, we've got a website, rawharcarnivalproject.com, or you can email me as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. So some of the first questions are around the dogs, the, guardi the guarding dogs, and in particular questions about are the local communities particularly pressured with the cost of maintaining the guarding dogs? And is there any knowledge of the effects of the shepherd dogs on other wildlife other than lions? So, for example, direct predation or landscape fear effects? Yeah. So to answer that briefly, uh, there was no, we pay for the cost for the first year of the puppy because that first year is very stressful. Because, and also because if people skimp in that year, you end up with uh, leg issues and bone issues for the dogs. So it's important they get enough nutrition through that first year. After that, the households take it over and we have seen people then being very willing to invest in that. 
but again there are ethics about how do we even support the first year of a of a dog's life when you've got families that are very food insecure we found that people are willing to invest because they really value their livestock we've seen the dogs being very protective we haven't seen impacts in terms of hunting or poaching with the dogs because of the breed of dog we use they're not good hunters at all they are specifically a guarding dog and if they want to go out and po poach they will use their own dogs for that so what type of benefits um, are people getting for those points amy you mentioned the different levels of points and what does the money pay for so at the moment they will get the each village has identified their priority areas so there are three key themes of education healthcare, veterinary medicine so every three months say the top village will get two thousand dollars and they will work out how to split that uh, between their healthcare committee their education committee and their veterinary medicine committee so that's um they decide that and that's something that we have a huge amount of transparency locally they post up what they want to do with it they post up the receipts from how they've spent the money and then all of the discussions at the community level for governance and transparency happen between the villagers and the village leaders because all of that the requirements of the programs it's all posted up publicly so they through their own committees decide what they want to spend it on great thank you and then there's quite a few questions on what your source of funding is for the benefit provision and um, where's the money coming from for the point system camera trapping and how long will this this program of work last for how can you ensure its sustainability the sustainability question always comes up um, we have a diverse range of funders who fund that uh, national geographic people's trust for endangered species um, sos iucn so various people we found it a very easy um, thing to get funding for it's a very sexy program to fund because you can get a lot of benefits you get the ecological monitoring you get community engagement and training and employment and then obviously it leads to the actual community benefits and development so it's something that i'm happy to share with anyone who's interested we found it very very useful and probably the biggest thing for changing uh, attitudes in terms of how long it will last it's gone on so far for three years we are hoping to consider it uh, to continue it long term and we are now starting to adapt it in a couple of the um, villages where we'll start to have a conservation payment and a conservation contract that will be tied up in that but we're just trying different approaches and different models but it's been that one has been very very successful and popular locally Related to that, Amy, what alternatives do you have in place if funding decreases? So if we're thinking about the current COVID crisis um, and the impact on the economy, what kind of challenges does that present for a programme like yours? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it definitely presents issues because we are entirely donor driven. I mean, we have a year's worth of operational reserves. That's what we try to build up on. But, but that is just for the core cost of it. So we would absolutely be forced to scale things back if if we lose funding and then i think that's on me to try to look at which other diverse sources of funding have we not approached yet in uk aid lots of these kinds of things to try to get a broad network of funders but the issue is that if donor driven projects you know decrease in terms of the funders then of course you can't do as much locally and we would then prioritize the really core needs the con that the communities have just to show that we are there long term in some sense at least until things pick up again and then Amy, there's a question here about communities and whether communities feel like they might be in competition with one another for the benefits. Have you seen any evidence between villages of any tensions or competition issues? We definitely have. Um, we found villages, of course, set up as a competition and that's both a strength and a weakness. So we found one of the issues was that people tended to put the camera traps by streams, which tended to be borders between villages. And then people were saying, well, that's unfair. They're pointing into our village land and that impala is ours. So why are they getting the points for it? So now we've said to them, you can't put the camera traps within a kilometre of your village boundary to try to reduce that. But if, so there's an ongoing competition, but it, the points get reset after three months. So if one village is doing well and another is doing badly, we will work with the one that's doing badly relatively and say to them, you know, what about moving your camera trap? Or they themselves will often say, how can we, do something that's better could we set aside an area of our land for wildlife so they are coming up with the solutions to try to improve wildlife detection on their land as well there's a few more questions and we're running a little bit out of time because we need to go on to a discussion with all of the panelists but there's an interesting yep. question here about ethical difficulties and whether you've 
you find whether there are any ethical difficulties that arise because one of the aims of the project is to actively change local cultures that are strongly centered on human wildlife interaction. There are many ethical issues and it's one of the things that really keeps me up at night in terms of just in this broad area, you know, what are we asking people to live alongside? What sort of costs should people have with them? Because we internationally want these species to survive. There are loads of ethical issues all the way through, as I alluded to briefly. Um, in terms of the ethics of changing culture, or particularly a, a culture that's been very predicated on lion killing, that isn't so much of an issue because this kind of traditional killing is actually not legal uh, locally anyway, and there's a lot of pressure on them to change. So it's a very good time for them to change to something where they get the benefits through conservation, not killing. And that's something, and none of the work is, we don't have any kind of enforcement of it. It's very much that if people want to join in, if they want to do it, they can. So it's not imposed upon people in any way. And we've seen huge community engagement and people wanting to ensure that this, this goes on long term. Great, thank you. So if I can invite all the panellists to unmute and we'll, we'll spend the last 15 minutes asking questions to all of you. I'll try and pick out some more of the questions that are relevant to all of you, your presentations. Um, and so if you could take it in turns to talk, if possible. So one of the first questions is around, you know, this is, there's been some really impressive initiatives that have been shared by all three of you. But just going back to this sustainability issue and thinking about the need for investment of resources, can you comment at all on the longer term effects of these efforts? What is the evidence for continued community and wildlife benefits after the projects end and the project workers leave the community areas? Is there true systemic change in how communities view wildlife or conservation beyond the presence of the project itself? Amy, did you want to start and then... Oh, sorry, sorry, yep. Yeah, yeah no, I'm happy right. to start on that. I mean, I have a fairly depressing view on that in that it takes a long time to change these views systemically and these actions. So I think we need at least a generation. And our project, for instance, has gone on for 10 years. But I think if, if we pulled out tomorrow, some of this would leave some long-term benefits because, you know, the scholarships we do, all kinds of the empowerment that's happened, but people would quickly revert towards killing wildlife if there wasn't the benefits to offset the costs. And I think it is on us internationally as community members as a wider community to ensure there is sustainability of funding because without it I don't see genuine change happening because that discrepancy between the costs and the benefits and who those accrue to is so great. It's Dillis here. Just to add to, to Amy's point of, about that, I think, you know, with this current situation of COVID-19 and the impact that that is having on global tourism um, and the funding streams that come from that, that support communities and pay for them to um, tolerate wildlife on their land, I think has huge implications for thinking about financial sustainability of a lot of our conservation models. And I think really emphasizes the need for a more long-term mechanism for financial flows from the north to the south, whether it's some kind of PES uh, system or biodiversity credits or whatever it is that goes beyond a reliance on externally funded projects or um, income streams from just from tourism or just from hunting or, or those kinds of um, revenue streams that are so affected by external conditions. Holly, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, yeah, thanks, Francesca. Holly here. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that, I very much agree with what Amy and, and Dillis have just said. I think one of the places there's, of course, in our community of practice, there's a lot of exchange going on right now. And as Dillis says, COVID-19 is a great test case, but probably a very, very extreme test case. One of the things that's coming out of the discussions is that the more localized the partnerships are, the more secure. So, you know, those that are, those that tend to be funded by either, you know, donors from other governments or from, you know, working through non-governmental organizations, because those organizations themselves are so dependent on that money, when that money dries up, they're, you know, they're, they have less ability. In some cases, you just have people who are living their lives and, whether they're farmers themselves or whether they have small scale tourism operations, 
the fluctuations, the bigger fluctuations, the globalized fluctuations may have much less impact because some industries continue because people stay in jobs and they continue to, to link to those communities more closely. So I think that's another reason why we also always have to make sure that there are local linkages for local communities of those who, you know, who live and share the ups and downs of any community life, just as we're seeing right now for communities around the world with COVID-19. I, I think that um, people are going to become a lot more localized. That is, that is a known effect of what's going on. And in some of these cases where we've worked, you have people that have been working for generations and generations with one another, going through droughts, going through extreme weather events, going through disease, tending to bounce back. So I think that that's also a very important anchor is what exactly comprises a community. A community is always comprised of more than, you know, just a small ethnic group. There might be the traders that bring food. There might be, you know, people that work on the roads. There could be any number of things. And it's important that people have community around them. Great, thank you. One of the next questions, and it's been asked by, raised by a few people, is, it, is this issue of corruption. And so you've all spoken about sh sharing in full benefits, but there are issues of corruption and elite capture, which really present quite tricky um, issues for conservation organisations. So have you got any advice on how you can how conservation organisations can tackle this within uh, some of the work that they're doing? Can we take the same order, maybe Amy and then Delis and Holly? Yeah, sure. So in terms of corruption, it's obviously a major issue. When we looked at lion conservation across uh, all the range countries, the biggest issue was governance and poor governance. I think the biggest way to deal with that is to take it to as low a level as possible. So with the example of our benefits, which we're now going to move into cash benefits, um, and that'll be an interesting change with probably more scope for corruption is one where people have to know how much money has been handed over, it's very public, what it's being spent on, you see the receipts, you make it as, tra as transparent as possible. It's a lot of work and I think for that to be effective it has to be done at the most locally devolved way possible because that's where you've got the accountability from, you know, from somebody say in the village to the village leader rather than it being a remote district or national uh, level gap that they just can't bridge. Yeah, uh, Dillis here. Um, yeah, I agree with Amy's focus on the local. And I think it's really important to remember that corruption can seem overwhelming and that, you know, we know that it can be rife from national governments right down to elite capture by particular people in a local community. And I think the real challenge is not to be overwhelmed by it, but to tackle those aspects of corruption that we can tackle. So probably focusing most on the local level is, is what conservation organizations can do most effectively. So not to say we just give up because we can't tackle, we can't solve corruption at the national government level. I think if uh, Holly will talk more about this, but the um, theory of change that we use for the first line of defense initiative um, has tackling um, governance or getting the, the right governance conditions in place as one of the key enabling factors that needs to be addressed. So we recognize that it's absolutely fundamental. And in many ways, having open conversations with local communities and going through the process that we go through with the first line of defense methodology is at very least a way of getting some of these issues out into the open and discussed and people being aware of who's getting what benefits and, and, and understanding that some things are going on that they weren't previously aware of is actually a really powerful tool to contribute to addressing corruption, particularly at the local level by making it more obvious and more, more transparent. Uh, one of the good case studies that's on the People Not Poaching website is the Ravuma Elephant Project in Tanzania. And there they talk a lot about the fact that they work with multiple different actors at all different levels. So uh, from the local level up to the national level. And because lots of different actors are in place and trying to work together, they see that as a really critical way of reducing corruption. Because again, it's kind of enforcing 
a level of transparency and scrutiny by others. So encouraging that partnership working across levels uh, can also be an effective way of starting to tackle corruption at some, at some level, but clearly not resolving the whole issue. Ali, a quick, quick yeah. addition, please. Yeah, I mean, just to go back to, to what I was talking about earlier when this very similar question was asked. So, you know, we, we could be talking about different things. I mean, corruption, when it comes to benefits accruing at the most local level, I would say that the comments made by, by Amy and, and Dillis are, are pretty much what I would agree. The greater transparency that occurs at the local level, the more you can get on top of that. Um, you'd probably, all of you, be very surprised to know that when we start to interrogate the assumptions um, through the flood methodology, we ask very explicit things, like who is involved in these various things. And they, they generally give you song and verse, whether it's you know, the local government, whether it's the local wildlife rangers, whether it's their own people. In fact, because we work in focal groups, many times the women will actually tell us about men in the, in the community. So you can find out a lot in there and they can also help to say what they think would be solutions. And many times they do have very clear ideas in terms of social norms or state-led law enforcement. But I think we have to separate this very clearly from corruption that comes in when you're dealing with the high, high benefits of illegal wildlife trade. This is a different level of corruption altogether than playing around with, you know, how we distributed some rather small benefits within the community. When we start talking about people that are making vast amounts of money at every single level within the value chain, now, of course, you're going to have to be taking other other kinds of actions to deal with corruption. But I think that the further you get from that local community, um, the further really that most non-governmentals can really operate in that field. And that becomes the field of those, you know, dealing with drugs and, and other forms of crime. And there are very, very active networks that work on corruption at those levels. So I think it's very important when we talk about corruption, you know, are we talking about elite capture at the most local level or are we talking about, um, you know, vast sums of money being made by putting people to work where they get paid very little to do the, the poaching and someone else, it goes up exponentially in terms of the benefits as you step down the supply chain. So I think that, um, you know, as Dillis said, governance, 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 and uh, at the local community level, there's a lot to be dealt with, but I think I'd just end by linking sustainability and governance and say that, you know, local communities being able to put in place their own forms of governance and strengthen those and helping to strengthen those rather than ever having that be dependent on any form of project um, would be the way that I would go. And we know that there are many cases where local communities have incredibly strong systems of self-governance. And it's the places where those systems have been badly damaged that other things are able to come in. So wherever we can continue to bolster those and help them in any way, I think that's probably our best starting point. Thanks, Holly. So time is ticking on, so we don't have much time for a few, um, many more questions, but one of the interesting questions that's come up from one of the attendees is what would speakers recommend for those organizations embarking on work with communities to prevent illegal wildlife trade where they're new or they don't have experience? And I ask you to be relatively short in your answers, Amy, Dillis and Holly, just a quick highlight, what was the top advice that you would give? Yeah, so for me, I think literally just spending the time listening to people, try to abandon your preconceived ideas about why they're doing it, really listen to it and yeah, and the answers will come from them. Yeah, I, I would have the same answer. Uh, the first line of defence approach is specifically intended for that. It's to help people understand where the community is coming from and what their perspectives are rather than going along with um, your own perspective. So I think using tools that help you understand the community and designing your illegal wildlife trade or human wildlife conflict initiative from the community outwards rather than trying to impose your own ideas. Yep, I would just, I would just add to that. Of course, just go to that website and you'll find a lot of stuff on the flood website but also to say that in the new training modules, we're going to be having um, a, a part of that which talks about the establishment of new projects 
And I think you're gonna find some guidance in there. So all of it for us starts at the local level and helping to build community voice. Great, and just, just so for all attendees benefit, we will be sharing the tools that Holly has mentioned and we'll be sharing all the presentations with you as well as a recording of the webinar. So um, we will make those available, widely available. And we are running 10 minutes beyond what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to start this, web this webinar at half past three, so I should really bring it to a close by thanking all the panelists their presentations it's very interesting thank you very much and thanks to the attendees for all of your questions and i apologize that we didn't manage to get to all of them time didn't permit we will be in touch with a recording of the webinar and we'll also share all the presentations um, and the tools that holly has mentioned the tools and resources that holly has referred to but if you do have any questions please don't hesitate to get in contact contact with us at IIED um, you can find my contact very easily on the IID website. My name is Francesca Booker so please do just drop me a line if you have any further questions. But thank you very much for participating and I hope you stay safe and, and take care of your families. Thank you for joining. Thanks.